Friends, Romans, reflective authors, lend me your ears. Ask not what your library or bookstore can do for you, but ask what you can do for your library or bookstore. Yeah, I know these are kind of purple passages from historical speeches, but it's really about you, the author, and strategies for working with libraries and bookstores. Coming up in this episode of the Stark Reflections Podcast. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing Podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 207 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this episode, it is the audio of a talk that I did at When Words Collide in, um, well, normally in Calgary, Alberta, but it was virtual this year uh, for the 2021 pandemic year. Uh, they turned the conference into a virtual conference, and so this was conducted uh, for When Words Collide uh, through a Zoom meeting, and I've extracted the audio to share with you. Now, the content is an author's guide. No, it's not an author's guide. That's the book it's based on. Uh, it's based on a few uh, podcast episodes you've probably heard here on the Stark Reflections podcast, also on my book, An Author's Guide to Working with Bookstores and Libraries, a little bit of information from the book Wide for the Win as well. But it's a talk on strategies uh, to use for libraries and bookstores as an author. So again, it's for both traditionally published authors and self-published authors. There's some ideas on things you can do. And uh, probably plenty of content you may have heard before, and I'm hoping that maybe just a refresher if you have heard it before, because sometimes you have to hear something a few times uh, before before it sinks in, or before that third time you hear it, that's when the inspiration strikes and you go, ah, I got an idea from this that I'm going to apply to my own unique author journey, which is what I hope you're doing when you're listening to this podcast. I hope you are, like me, reflecting on the things you're learning about taking everything with a bit of a grain of salt, and then applying it to your own goals and your own paths. Um, so in any case, that's coming up later in this episode. I'm going to do a brief personal update, but before that, let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Now, if you are looking for ways to get your audiobooks into libraries... Look no further than Findaway Voices because you can't get your audiobooks in the libraries through ACX. Findaway Voices not only has more than 43 retail and library systems, but is the premier way to get your audiobook into library systems if you are an indie author. So the way that Findaway Voices works is you uh, can find an narrator through them or you can upload an audiobook file that you've already had professionally produced. And then you can select which of the 43 plus retail and library systems you want to distribute to, or you can just distribute to all of them. Now, the way that it works is if you've selected uh, some of the various library wholesale platforms, the library or the librarian buyer or the acquisitions person at the library can see that your titles are available through their catalog. So depending on what they use, if they use Overdrive or if they use Biblioteca or or Hoopla, or one of the other dozens of, of library distribution platforms around the world, whatever that local library is that they use, chances are it's going to be available to them through Findaway Voices. So it's not immediately available in the library until a library purchases it or puts it into the cost per checkout program. Now, the way that I found out about the value of selling audiobooks through libraries was I had some digital chapbooks available, like some short story collections, many short story collections available through the library markets. And I kept seeing these reports coming in from Findaway. I was like, who's this? I've never heard of this platform. And, and I realized it was a library wholesale platform that had a cost per checkout model. And what was happening is I was getting uh, you know, a, a, a micro payment for every time somebody checked that book out of whatever library system that they were purchasing through. And those can really add up. So if you're looking for ways to get your 
audiobooks into library markets as well as into digital bookstore markets, look no further than Findaway Voices. Some phenomenal tools and control available to you and the author. You can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. In terms of a personal update, this has been a very, very productive week. I just finished a, an amazingly packed weekend of the virtual When Words Collide conference. Of course, you heard from the previous episode, a keynote from Stina Holmes, as well as uh, one of my talks uh, that I'm sharing with you here today. And if you're a patron, then you may have already heard the other talk that I shared to the patrons only feed on author branding for 2021 with a huge thank you to my patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash stark reflections. Hope you're gaining some value there. I'll probably be reading some of the comments I've seen from patrons uh, in the next episode. But a uh, busy week in terms of uh, pro book projects and, and making some progress. So first of all, I got the uh, edits back from my editor for... Um, Publishing Pitfalls for Authors, which is coming out on Tuesday, August 24th, just a few days from now. So I got the first pass edit back. Then I went in and, and I, I made the EPUB version and I uploaded it because, you know I, know, I know I still had some time, but I wanted to get that later edited version in. Uh, and I, I did my tweaks, obviously, and then I sent it back to my editor, who then did a sort of a final pass slash proofread. And then I just got back that back um, yesterday. I'm recording this on um, August 19th, uh, on the 18th. And so I went back through that final pass, did the final, you know, 20, 30 uh, additional tweaks, uh, created the EPUB uh, file. And I used Dave Chesson's uh, Atticus uh, for that. It was an interesting experience. I still had to, when I got the EPUB, I was still wasn't satisfied with the look and feel. There were still a few tweaky things. So I opened up Sigil and I, and I did that editing uh, manually. I loaded that up to all the, all the platforms. And then uh, this morning, uh, when I got up, I went in to work on the, um, the print version, uh, which I have loaded. Uh, and I've got the paperback available through draft to digital print, t print beta. Uh, and that should be, I'm not sure, it's probably, it may not appear by the 24th, but I just wanted to get that out there. I'm pretty pleased with the process. I've been using Adobe InDesign for that, so that process has been nailed down. But also in parallel, at the end of last week, I got, uh, Joanna Penn and I got back from her proofreader, reader, the uh, Relaxed Author. And so I went over that in bits and pieces throughout the weekend <laughs> between sessions uh, and then we just did a final pass of the digital proof. And then Joe is working on a print proof that she's going to send me. She's going to have a print proof herself. We're going to do that one final check for that book coming out in September. So I'm taking a bit of a breather uh, before I sink my teeth back into my uh, Fright Night's Big City, the next uh, fiction uh, project, which um, I'm looking forward to doing. So it's been it's been fun busyness uh, and, and some great things going on. Also working uh, with Sarah Cadiz on her Kiss Me in the Rain, which is a romantic thriller, phenomenal novel, and she's rewritten it and um, releasing that through Stark Publishing. And so I'm also going to be working through sort of my final kind of final line edit, copy edit uh, of that as we prepare uh, the advanced readers copies and all that stuff for her also September release. So busy enough to keep me out of most trouble. But other than that, I hope you enjoy this talk from When Words Collide on uh, strategies for working with libraries and bookstores. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session on working with bookstores and libraries. My name is Mark Leslie Lefebvre. I have uh, been an author, uh, well, since I was a kid. And I've worked in bookstores since 1992. And so what I've done is I've put together, uh, this is the first time I'm ever doing uh, this particular talk. I've written about it and talked about it, but I've never actually done a talk on working with bookstores and libraries. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the screen share. I'm going to walk through uh, the presentation of what I put together for you. And if you have any questions or any uh, such things, uh, you can go ahead and hopefully hold off uh, till the end. And then I can uh, answer questions like in the last uh, 10 15 minutes of the session. So let, let's uh, just jump right in to the presentation I put together. So this is Library and Bookstore Strategies for Authors. High level, as I said, I've been a bookseller since 92. I've worked in every kind of bookstore imaginable, former president of the Canadian Booksellers Association, 
I was the person, the director of self-publishing and author relations at Kobo, who created Kobo Writing Life. I've presented on publishing and writing throughout Canada, the US and the UK, France, Germany, and Italy. I've been very lucky to get to do those things. My very first published short story was 92, the same year I started in the industry. And my very first self-published book, well, before all the cool kids were doing it, was 2004. And that's when I created the Stark Publishing imprint. My first trad pub book was in 2006. And I've edited uh, now actually now nine anthologies. I haven't updated this. Um, and I'm a serial collaborator and a giant book nerd. So this presentation is based mostly on the content from uh, two of my books. That's the uh, Working with Libraries and Bookstores and Wide for the Win. I'm going to tell you they are available in ebook and print. And I would highly recommend that you ask for them at your local bookstore. Maybe ask them to order a book uh, print copy and they're probably not gonna have it in store and I'll explain why that is. But please also do ask for it through your local library because they have access to either the print or the ebook for you. Very, very convenient. And you'll be doing both me and the library and yourself a huge favor. Now, there's never been a better time in the history of writing and publishing to be a writer. There's more choices, more options than ever before. And that is a phenomenal thing for writers. It can be overwhelming because there's so many choices available to you. But just remember this, you're the one who's created the content. You're the one who gets to decide how it gets published, where it gets published. But you're also the one who has the onus on how are you going to work within the industry, in this particular case, bookstores and libraries, to ensure that your book can actually get in front of the right customers. Now, digital made it easy. Digital publishing, so eBooks and print on demand, made it easier than ever before for more writers to realize their dream of being published. They did not have to wait for somebody in New York or Toronto or London to give it a thumbs up. They could do it themselves if they wanted to. Now, true and proper self-publishing does not equal low quality. And a lot of people still think that. The only self in self-publishing should be self-directed. You're in control of everything. Now, that means you professionally self-publish. And, and the professional indie authors know that they bear all of the responsibilities that a publisher normally has for editorial, for design, et cetera. So all that the self in self-publishing is when done properly is that self-directed. I can decide when it's going to be released. I can decide the price. I can decide the cover. I can decide what editor is working on it, et cetera. I can decide if I want to make changes at any point in time. I don't have to wait for someone else, else to give me permission. Now, the ones who do this are the ones who do succeed and prosper. And not necessarily early on. It often can take years before they establish that. But digital is only the start because why even think about bookstores and libraries? So many indie authors think, oh, um, I can make all my money by selling ebooks and I don't really have to interact with people. And that is true. That is possibility. But why would you want to consider working with bookstores and libraries other than they're some of the most magnificent places in the universe? This is a study from the Panorama Project uh, through Portland State University. And they showed for discoverability of books is how people discovers recommendations from friends, a favorite author, recommendations from family. So personal recommendations are pretty important. The discoverability, they may discover through online bookstores, they may discover through brick and mortar bookstores, and they may discover through in-person events or even sometimes virtual events like When Words Collide. Um, and they often go by genre and category, then by author, and then they look for reviews. Now, one in three people uh, bought a book in a bookstore that they first found in a library. 75% of respondents to this particular survey they did were library card holders. So it was very library centric. But the most important factors for book purchase. Now, this is not necessarily the thing that drew them to it because the cover often will draw them or draw them away. But this is the decision for purchase usually starts with category. I'm looking for books in this category. They walk into a bookstore or library, usually in a category or they're browsing by category. The author is usually a, a prominent feature because they may be going with authors that they already know and like. They saw a wonderful keynote talk at When Words Collide and they want to go check out their books. Then they look at reviews, they consider the price, the cover is a part of it, especially if it's in the genre and it's an author they know. The cover is not as prominent there. The pr cover may be more prominent when they don't know who you are. Um, 
And those are some of the factors involved. Now, this is from BookNet Canada, one of the studies. This is how uh, people discover, uh, discover books or decide to buy books. They read the book description. They see what the genre is. Look at the cover, who the author. So very, very similar. You're seeing all of these things that can happen. Uh, how people generally discover. Uh, word of mouth is still 44% when you think about that. Now, browsing online is high. It's 32%. Browsing in physical stores. And this is a Canadian data, whereas the Portland one is American data. So you can see some of the fluctuations. Public libraries are still high. Um, social media, nominees, winners, online communities like Goodreads, et cetera. Uh, television, radio is relatively small compared to that, uh, as well as print, uh, et cetera. This was the average Canadian book buyer about four or five years ago through BookNet Canada, just to give you an idea of who they are, where they are. 59% of book buyers are female, usually have some sort of post-secondary. They're married, they're employed somehow. Uh, paperback, 54%, 25% hardcover, and 17% ebook. That's probably gone up a little bit more where ebook's closer to 20%. Uh, in that case, and one of the challenges is when you're thinking about traditional publishing is the traditional published books, the ebooks are often more expensive than the paperback. So it's, uh, it's something that the traditional publishing uh, world is not necessarily doing all that well. But women are 5% more likely than men to purchase a book as a gift for someone else. So that's another thing that uh, can become important, especially when you're thinking about bookstores. Now, books uh, engaged per month by gender, you'll notice print books is still relatively high. Yes, ebooks are continuing to grow, but some stats show that in the overall industry, between 70 and 80% of all book sales are still coming from print books because most people still have not read an ebook. There's nothing like walking into a bookstore or a library and finding one of your books on the shelves. That is honestly one of the most sweet experiences. This is Sarah Rosette and I at Novela Sync in St. Pete, uh, Florida. For, uh, for Novela Sync, uh, was it three years ago? And we walked into, we went into Haslam's bookstore. It was sort of a, a day trip where a bunch of writers went to bookstores and some breweries. And this was the first stop. And lo and behold, you found on the shelf, my traditionally published book, Tomes of Terror. And you found, uh, Sarah's self-published, indie-published title on in the bookstore. So interestingly enough, it is possible to go into a foreign city, foreign state, foreign province, find your book on a bookstore shelf, whether it's traditionally published or self-published. Now, it's a little bit harder in one case, and I'm going to kind of explain that. Sarah and I had to do a heck of a lot of work to make this happen. Now, for example, the reason Haslam's had Tomes of Terror is because I wrote about them, the ghost of Jack Kerouac that hang that resides in Haslam's bookstore. I several times gone in and interviewed and talked to staff who shared firsthand accounts of their encounters with the ghost. So they carried it because it was easily available through a traditional publisher, but also because I did some work. The reason they carried Sarah's book is she was using print on demand. Now she did make her books fully returnable for her experience, and this is like through Ingram, through Lightning Source, print on demand, she made them fully returnable. She was willing to take that risk because the returns for her were, were small. I got burned the first time I did that. I actually had uh, Chapters Indigo buy uh, about 300 copies of my very first self-published book in 2004, which was kind of cool. But they put one book in every store across Canada. Nobody knew about it because, you know, the average chapters are indigo has 70,000 to 100,000 titles and it. it was just spined. So six months later, half the books came back unsold. And I actually lost more money on the returns than I made on the sale. So I was actually in the hole uh, for, for several months while I had to sell more copies to, to, to get back out of that hole. Uh, in Sarah's case, uh, I asked the manager of the bookstore, how did you find out about this book? And he said, uh, I had a customer, uh, Sarah also had had some traditionally published books. And so he did have some of her other books and had customers come in and say, oh, my God, I love her. I'm reading her new series. He learned about the series from a customer. He went and found them online. And he said he would have ordered them even if they were non-returnable because he knew that he had customers that loved her writing. So, again, uh, she had to do some extra work, but also her fans did some of the work for her. Now, being self-published doesn't mean you can't get into bookstores and libraries. Having a publisher may make having uh, getting books in a bookstore's library a little bit easier, but not, not necessarily. It may make it easier. I want to kind of get into that because in either case, it really comes down to a relationship that you have to curate and you have to nurture. 
I'd like to say, don't ask what your local library or bookstore can do for you. Ask what you can do for your local bookstore or library. That's a consideration you want to keep in the back of your mind. It's a relationship where you both need to benefit. And if you don't understand the benefits to the library or bookstore, it's going to be difficult to get the benefits for yourself. I'm going to go over some high level ebook strategy. So, ebooks, the publication of ebooks is free. I'm not talking about the editing and the cover design and all that, but that's just publishing is free. What happens is the retailer keeps a percent or the distributor. So you can publish direct to most platforms or so Amazon, Apple, Google Play, Kobo, Nook. Those are the, the main five uh, retail platforms for eBooks. There's dozens of others, but you can also use a distributor to get to the platforms like draft to digital or Smashwords. There's many others out on the market. Difference is it's usually a 10% difference because you're the middleman. Uh, the distributor gets to keep a, a small cut, but even among these digital publishing play platforms, maybe less Amazon and it's more difficult with Apple, but definitely with Kobo and Nook, which are born out of retail um, uh, bookstores, relationships are important. Having relationships it can happen. That can happen through conferences. You got Dave Reynolds from Indigo, for example, who's here. You maybe are, uh, you had a chance to do a Q&A session with him with WinWords Collide. At other uh, writers' conferences, you may have representatives from Amazon or Kobo or uh, Google or Nook at the conferences where you can interact with them. It could be Smashwords, draft to digital Publish Drive, any of those other places. <laughs> It's really important to attend to those sessions, see what they have to say, listen to their podcasts. Kobo Writing Life offers a podcast, a podcast. Ingram Spark has a podcast as well. Communicate with them and potentially think about offering them content that would actually be fitting for their audience. Think about what it is that you can do for them to help them out. That's a great place to start with curating those relationships. Now, be inclusive in your approach. This is really, really important. And many of the retailers pay attention to this. So include links on your author website to all of the platforms, not just Amazon. Tag them when you're sharing your book links so that they can see that you're actively promoting your book at their store. Ideally, use a universal book link. Uh, Books2read.com offers them for free, whether you're traditional or indie published. This is just an example. Over on the left, you have Haunted Hospitals, which is a traditionally published book through Dundurn, Canada's largest independent publisher. And over on the right, you have A Canadian Werewolf in New York, which is published under my Stark Publishing imprint. It's self-published. Self so what I have is instead of saying, here are the eight Amazon links, and here are the 29 Kobo links, and here are the 30 Google links, and here's the one Nook link, and... I just have a single link to rule them all. And I can put my affiliate codes. So I have my Amazon affiliate and my Apple affiliate in there. So if anyone clicks this link and goes off and buys anything, I'm still making my money off the affiliate codes. And there's a little bit of tracking right now. It shows me the top three stores uh, that people click onto. It's soon going to have a, a, a little bit more of those free analytics for people. But again, whether it's trad published or self indie published, I have a single link for all of these uh, links in the different formats. Uh, it is soon going to be including print as well. Ebook strategies, Rackets and Kobo. So Kobo has a unique partnership with dozens of bookstores around the world. So here in Canada, for example, if, when your book is loaded to Rackets and Kobo, whether it's direct at Kobo, whether it's through a publisher or whether it's through a distributor like draft to digital it's automatically going to get listed on Chapters Indigo, who's their Canadian bookstore partner. Uh, they just handle the ebooks for them. So they do that in dozens of countries around the world where WH Smith in the UK, for example, Fnac in France, Montadori in Italy are some of the bookstore partnerships that Rackets and Kobo has. So if your book is an ebook on Kobo, it's available through that bookstore, through their ebook offering. In the US, you have IndieBound.org, which is owned by the American Booksellers Association. It's an opportunity to, to connect eBooks through, um, through local bookstores. And bookshop.org, which came onto the scene just about a year and a half ago, that is primarily print books, but offers the opportunity to have an online bookshop in support of a local bookstore, which you can do as an author to help support the local bookstore. So these are just some of the things you can do with eBook strategies. I like to say be creative. So one, one possible idea you might wanna do when you're thinking about a bookstore, Offer free ebook. Um, hey, if you show me that you bought this at any of these local bookstores, contact me. So send me a picture of you with the book and the receipt or anything like that, just to show that you got that. I'll send you the ebook for free because I, I want 
I want you to support the bookstore, but I want you to have something extra in the convenience of being able to read it on your phone or on your Kindle or Kobo or whatever. Maybe there's content or value that you can offer as support of, there's Independent Bookstore Day, which takes place in, um, I think it's in May in the US and it's in August in Canada. Uh, it's different times of the year, but there's, there's these days where even during the pandemic, when you can't get into the bookstore, you can do some virtual events. Um, a, a print book strategy you can try. Now, the best way, as I, as I mentioned, to get a book into bookstores uh, is through a traditional publisher. Uh, ideally, a publisher that doesn't use print on demand, uh, a publisher that actually does large offset print runs, actually has books in warehouses, warehouses those books, and has an established sales relationship with numerous bookstores. Now, I, I, I am a publisher, Stark Publishing, but I wouldn't dare call myself a publisher in the way that I think of traditional publishers who actually have stock in a warehouse and sales reps out there interacting. Uh, like when I was a bookstore buyer, I would interact with uh, sales reps who would come in and show me catalogs and suggest things that I should buy from their catalogs. That is the best way to get in, into print bookstores. But even if you have a publisher, you probably still have to establish and leverage connections and relationships. And it often, I recommend start locally. That's a really good place to start. And remember that with print, whether it's self-published or traditionally published, I mean, the percentage that you keep as an author is so tiny. It's typically tiny. It's like usually about 8%. Uh, that's what I'm getting from most of my publish, uh, traditional publishing deals. And when I think about the percentage I end up with, once everyone takes a slice of the pie on my print on the band stuff that I've self-published, it may be somewhere in that range. Sometimes it's a little higher. Sometimes it's a little lower because everyone needs a piece of the pie in print with ebook there's less pieces of that pie getting divided. Something you can do, just some ideas, uh, order author copies through your local bookstore. So for example, Dundurn gives me 40% off uh, if I wanna buy author copies directly from the publisher. I can get them for 40% off so I can resell them myself at uh, local events and stuff. I don't actually make royalties off of those, but if I contact my local bookstore and I order a box through their bookstore, they'll get the 40% or higher sometimes, depending on the volume that they're ordering. And I usually request, hey, I'll order a box. You just order it in, it's 50 or 60 copies of the book. Can you give me the staff discount? Which means they're gonna make 10% still. It's a pass-through sale. They don't even have to unbox it practically. They just have to grab the, the purchase order, receive it into their system, ring it through. It's like in and out. It's an in and out sale. It registers as a sale with BookNet Canada here in Canada or with Nielsen BookScan in the States. So it counts as a sale, supports the bookstore, but also supports the publisher as well in a positive way. So that's just some, one of the things that I've done through uh, several different bookstores uh, over the years. And, and, and it's worked for indie bookstores, uh, I think most of the time where they're willing to do that because, hey, it's a guaranteed sale of a, of a minimal margin. Why not take it? Uh, and, and it is showing us collaborating. I've, I've offered personally signed books, order through a local bookstore. Hey, uh, if you want a personally signed book for anywhere in the world, order it from this bookstore. And they'll uh, contact me, I'll bring stock over, I'll sign it, they'll ship it because they have the means. They do shipping and receiving all the time. Uh, and it saves me the hassle, but it also shows my support through a local bookstore. And then they either buy it on uh, consignment uh, or sometimes they'll just uh, order order it in, uh, but oftentimes it's consignment and I just bring it directly to them. So print, another print book strategy, if it's available through a distributor um, or if it's traditionally published, it can also include Ingram print on demand. The bookstore might just order it. Uh, traditional titles, as I mentioned, are usually fully returnable. There's less risk to the bookstore. Now I have offered for bookstores to bring in stock, uh, whether it's returnable or non-returnable, I, sometimes I want them to bring in more stock just so we don't sell out. I've actually sold out uh, a few of my book launch events where they actually sold out in half an hour. And you sat there for the next two hours wondering, like you just wanted to greet people and say, I'm sorry, they sold out. But I'll offer to buy any stock that doesn't sell so they're not stuck with it or they don't have to return it. That's another nice thing I do in collaboration with the bookstore. And I'm gonna talk about the reasons why I do that later. And then there's there's often consignment options. It's a lot more work. It's a lot more work for the bookstore and it's a lot more work for you, but sometimes it's the only option that they have. And that can be used with traditional or indie, mostly with indie uh, published titles because when it's trad, they'll usually get it through the distributor. Be generous. This is a couple things that I've done. Uh, so 
when I released Creepy Capital, uh, uh, Haunted Books, uh, Haunted Ghost Stories of Ottawa, I created a t-shirt on the front. It had the book cover. And on the back, it says, I love to haunt. And I made a shirt for the three different indie bookstores I was doing the book launch at for that weekend, at, at different locations, different times. I love to haunt perfect books. And I had their URL. What is your favorite bookish haunt? And then uh, when I launched Tomes of Terror, it's like, I love to haunt Hamilton Public Library. And I made a bunch of, I, so I made an extra bunch of shirts for perfect books in different sizes. And I gave them 10 of them. And I said, here you go. Because I know indie bookstores have really passionate local customers that are their, their regulars who come in all the time. And they love to give them free stuff. It's usually swag from publishers. Hey, here's a Michael Connolly coffee mug. And here's a here's a um, Diana Gabaldon, uh, you know, the sword letter opener or whatever uh, from Outlander. Uh, they, they get stuff like this from publishers all the time. So I wanted to make something that helped them advertise their store and their favorite customers probably love wearing a shirt with their store logo on it, but it also has my book on it. And they did the same thing with uh, Tomes of Terror. I love to haunt, uh, you know, what's your favorite bookish haunt or bookstore haunt or whatever. So again, just a little thing for marketing something that can last a long, long time. I've done uh, collaborations and experiments. Uh, when I was launching Creepy Capital, I contacted the local Ghostbusters group and I said, would you be willing to come out? Because they, they, you know, they love uh, doing cosplay, they love dressing up. So I had a ghost, so you can come and meet a Ghostbuster uh, when, you, when you came into the store. So one of them you can see is over at a chain store at Indigo, uh, Rito uh, Center downtown. And this other one was at an independent bookstore uh, just up the street. Uh, as well, two different days, two different Ghostbusters, just a really great opportunity for bringing people in. It was something that was related to the book and would draw people into the store. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's different styles that you can do because again, they may not be necessarily interested in the book, but they come for the Ghostbuster, but while they're there, their interest may be piqued. I've done collaborations with Epic Books in Hamilton, Ontario, uh, close to Halloween. I actually had a, a fog machine set up outside. A friend of mine who's six foot four dressed up in a skull and mask. And I was inside sharing ghost stories. <laughs> and he was just attracting people. And, and he was dancing to a repeated loop of Michael Jackson's Thriller over and over on, on Lock Street uh, in Jamie's relatively small store. Just basically attracting people going, what is going on over there? They had to come over and check out my goofy friend dancing in a, in a skull costume. Uh, and then they came in for those uh, free ghost stories. And again, they, uh, Jamie had copies of Haunted Hamilton. She also had some of my uh, other books uh, available for sale. I've collaborated with the local ghost walk groups. This is Haunted Hamilton. They came to my, they came to my ghost walk. Uh, they did a free ghost walk for my launch of, of Haunted Hamilton. And it was a really awesome a tour where people got a chance to check them out. Uh, it was like a 15 minute tour and they normally do two hour tours. It was completely free. Everyone got a coupon so they could, you know, get $5 off if they booked a full tour uh, on one of their full tours. And obviously uh, I had a local bookstore there that, that came in and was there to sell the books. Uh, and it was at the library because the library sometimes will sell the books or will sometimes um, work with the bookseller or sometimes they just allow you to bring in either your own books or why not work with a bookstore. Um, that was a good one because I think I had over 120 people show up for that downtown event. Um, this is a one sheet and it's available over at marklesley.ca slash authors, bookstores, libraries. This is an example from uh, Rachel Amphlett. Uh, she's a UK uh, crime author. And this is the one sheet that she sends out often to libraries or bookstores. You can download a sample of it. So you can see there's other samples from Rachel at that same page. But just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that uh, she's, she's offering and other tips for authors, bookstores and libraries. Really important to define yourself as a local author or a big fish in a small pool. If I compare myself to Stephen King as a guy who writes scary stories, I'm not going to get anywhere. But if I compare myself to every single other horror author from my small town of Lavac, Ontario, I'm the number one author. Well, I'm the only one, but I'm the number one horror author from that town. So that's a really important thing. My best-selling book, Spooky Sudbury, from my small uh, city in uh, mid-northern Ontario, 90,000 people still outsells Macabre Montreal, city of millions, the second most populous city in Canada. Why? The local interest factor. It, but the first book was released in 2013, I believe. 
in, in 2021, I'm still selling more copies uh, per year than of the more recent Macabre Montreal because of Sudbury. It can be you as a local author, and it's not just where you live, uh, where you born, where you lived for a number of years, where you went to school, where you were a resident. Think of that, you know, Lincoln slept here. <laughs> you were an author who slept in that town or lived in that town. That can be a factor. Hey, so-and-so spent six months in whatever, writing a book or was, uh, you know, in Banff, you know, on this, on this retreat and wrote the book over four days. Anything that ties you to the local spot can be used in an interesting way, especially when you're talking to bookstores and libraries. And it can be the content of your book is local. So it could be set in that locale. So for example, my novel, A Canadian Werewolf in New York, my main character lives at the Algonquin Hotel, which is a literary hotel in New York. I've actually had readers who didn't know about the Algonquin Hotel actually go and look it up because they didn't know if I was making it up or not. Was it a real hotel? Because it sounds so cool. And sure enough, it's a real hotel. I'd like to believe that maybe some people will end up staying at the Algonquin Hotel because they heard about it through that. There's an opportunity for me not just to work with the bookstore and library, but I'd love to send them some copies of the book and just put them on display in their, uh, in their lobby. That Maybe that's because, hey, this hotel is featured in this book or this series, I should say. Here are the important things not to forget. Bookstores are businesses. They have costs, so many hidden costs, and they operate on really low margins. So the books that they carry, they need to sell. They have to sell in order for them to pay all those costs to keep the lights on. Now, libraries are similar. Now, the books they stock don't sell, but they need to circulate to customers. Otherwise, they're just dead space, taking up space. They're Frustrating. Librarians want people to be engaged and interact with the library. And, and much of that is the things they check out and the stuff that goes into circulation. So they want stuff that is going to resonate with their clientele. Be mindful of the time that you approach them. You don't walk in on December 24th, you know, just three hours before it's closing the best Christmas the shopping day of the year and, and try to pitch your book to them. They're a little bit busy right now. So think about the approach. So sometimes when you go into a bookstore and something's going on, it may not be the most, the best time uh, to, to connect with them, whether it's a librarian, whether it's a bookseller. Uh, the biggest question that you should ask as an author is, how is this book or does this book help them achieve their goal of selling? Will it sell to their customer base? Who is their customer base? If I go into Back of Phoenix books, a uh, science fiction and fantasy bookshop in Toronto. And I try to pitch them my contemporary fiction book, or I try to pitch them one of my nonfiction books for writers and publishers, not really going to go over well. But if I try to pitch them, you know, hey, you should carry my urban fantasy novel, A Canadian Werewolf in New York, that's more their cup of tea. You should carry the science fiction anthology I edited, that's more their cup of tea. So think about who the customers are and how your book connects with who those customers are. And then also consider what your first impressions might be when you reach out to them, when you email them, when you see them in person, when you talk to them. Ideally, do you already have a relationship and support them before you're asking for something from them? Have you given them something? Uh, have you given them business? Have you given them support through the local community? That's a great way to have a, a real relationship with a bookseller, not just think of them as a conduit for a place where you can sell your books. And another thing that's really, really incredible is please help them out by using familiar comp titles in your descriptions. Um, and and a lot of people say, say, well, that's dumbing my book down. My book is so unique, so beautiful, and so wonderful. And it's like, unlike anything in, that's ever existed in the history of publishing. But let's remember, we know the common. We have to think about the common. We have to understand things based on what we already know. So for example, when I describe my novel, uh, Stowaway, uh, in the Canadian Werewolf series, I say, well, it's like planes, trains, and automobiles meets Logan. Now, those are movies, not books, but most people are familiar with planes, trains, and automobiles. So they go, okay, it's a road trip, some sort of misadventure on some sort of road trip. And uh, Logan involves a cross-country trip with a, a man and a, 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 young, uh, a young girl that he's protecting. I think I know what this book is about. It's about a guy who's a werewolf who's trying to protect a young girl from another predator as they're rushing on a train across um, the US from Manhattan to Stowe, Vermont. So that kind of dumbs it down to simple concepts so they can understand who the potential readers might be. I have plenty of bookseller insights in the Stark Reflections and Writing and Publishing podcasts uh, with Susan Faw, an indie author herself who uh, opened up uh, an independent bookstore 
specifically to stock books from indie authors. Yes. Uh, and it's in uh, it's in Northern Ontario, not too far from Thunder Bay. It's right on the highway there. And Susan's, she moved up there. She bought the store, opened it up in the midst of a pandemic. And uh, heck, a whole bunch of my titles and pretty much, you know, 90 percent of the bookstore is indie author titles, which is pretty phenomenal. I've got other ones, uh, Author Author, which is an online bookstore. And I talked to Laura Hayden, who uh, opens and runs that. And she also shares a lot of great insights from their perspective. And if you're looking for librarian insights, I've got uh, insights from the youth services librarians in Pennsylvania, uh, just a general conversation about working with uh, bookstores and libraries. And then the, the, the consumer survey from the Pandama, uh, Pandora project, the immersive media report, I've got an interview with the two doctors who put that together uh, just earlier in 2021. This is just some of my contact information, uh, where you can find me online, et cetera, if you wanna take a screenshot. I'm at the half hour mark, so I thought I would stop my sharing and move over so I can see your beautiful faces again and uh, answer questions, et cetera. And just so I can see questions, but feel free to unmute your mic and uh, go ahead and ask any questions that you have. If not, I'll start reading the questions. Uh, can you ever really have enough skulls? Julie said, no, you're, it's so true. You can't ever have enough skulls. Uh, Brandy said, will this document be available later? Yeah, Brandy, what I can do is I can make the, um, uh, I make a PDF available, um, try to figure out how to get that to you guys. Um, you can always email me, mark at marklesley.ca. That's a great way for me to send it to you, mark at marklesley.ca. See, you don't have to spell. You don't have to spell a fave. I'll put I'll put that in uh, in the uh, comments uh, so you can copy and paste. I think I typed it correctly. Uh, can you put up the where to find you for a moment again? Ah, yeah. Let me do that again. Uh, share screen where you can find me. Hopefully you can see that. Um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Over on the left, you got my email, etc. And to, come on, please follow me on TikTok. I have no followers there and no action. Come on, I need some love. Um, <laughs> uh, Michael asks, if your comp mentions an author name, is that a bad thing? No, so Michael, a, a comp is really just sharing to a potential buyer or a bookseller or a librarian. Hey, it's like a Michael Connolly novel written by Terry Pratchett or something like that, right? So when you're using them now, a comp title, when you're sharing what it's about, there are certain online uh, advertising platforms where you can't, like you can't put an author name in Amazon keywords, for example, but you can definitely help a bookseller, help a librarian, help a potential reader say, yeah, it's like so-and-so uh, wrote a book on this topic. Like imagine, you know, imagine, you know, it's like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as, a as applicable to, as if it were written by blank. So that, that just helps people understand a little bit of where you're coming to. Alledup.ca. So Lori says Alledup.ca seems useful and wondering if self-publishers can use it. I don't know what Alledup.ca is, so I'm going to have to look. Unless you can explain what it seems to be, Lori. Don't be shy. You guys can unmute yourselves if you want to ask. Mark, I had one a little bit farther up in the chat, but just wondering then if we should make our books returnable or not. Yeah. So Danielle, that's a great question. Um, I've been bit by that and, and, I, and I lost, um, it, was, it was only a couple hundred dollars, but I was in the hole for a while with my first self-published book uh, by making it fully returnable. I stopped doing that because I kind of got gun shy, <laughs> you know, once bitten, twice shy kind of thing. But what I have done recently is I, I use draft to digital print to make all my paperbacks now because it's just easier to, to get them out there. And I use Ingram Spark for the hardcovers and I've made my hardcovers returnable. The hardcovers are so expensive. They're these nice trade like uh, cloth um, hard, hard case uh, cover without, without a dust jacket. They're just printed right on the hard, hard case. And, and I've done that because they're so bloody expensive that I don't think they're going to order a lot. <laughs> and they're probably only going to order it if they believe they're going to sell it or probably for a special order for someone who wants the hardcover. So I have 
made them available. And I think of the, and again, I don't think I've sold more than 50 or 60 copies of the hardcover of a Canadian werewolf in New York, only to the diehard people who wanted to have the hardcover. I think I only had one return from Ingram on that. So, so it wasn't like I sold 50 and I had 25 returned, which that return ironically costs more than the sale. So uh, that one return didn't hurt me. So I've been lucky, but I would be very, very, very careful. Or maybe you can make it temporarily returnable <laughs> and test it out. Um, again, I, it, was, it was great that a chapters buyer uh, went and bought a bunch of my books and wanted to support me. I was, that was very nice of them. But you know, buying the books without any marketing support, <laughs> and nobody knows, they just show up in the store, and no one knows about them, and they're going to get returned. Um, that's rarely going to happen to people. So that, that's, what, that's what hurt me. Uh, stats from Ingram do show that about 1% uh, on average, 1% of books get returned at Ingram. I just happen to be in that negative 1%. Um, Lori says, all, all lit up seems to be a promo book distro collaborative of some sort, and they pay shipping for Canadian publishers to ship to remote areas. Oh, that looks interesting. I'd have to check it out. So thanks, Lori. I'll have to look it up and see. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll end up talking about it on, on the Stark Reflections podcast if it looks intriguing or if it scares me and I think it's a scam, I will definitely share. Um, Sarah says, looks like all that up only accepts books published from all oh, literary press group members. Okay, and literary press group, like they represent a lot of smaller publishers in Canada. So um, that's cool. Um, uh, and I guess I, I guess I missed Danielle's question. Oh, didn't Mark Dawson get into trouble for ordering a huge amount of... Yeah, so, yeah, what Mark Dawson did, uh, so Danielle made a comment. Um, Mark Dawson uh, had a deal with a traditional publisher and, and he offered to buy, because he's so bloody rich, copies of his books so he could sign them and ship them, whatever. And it was, and it was again, in support of the bookstores, in support of the library. And it ended up, because it was going through the, the book scan, it ended up that people were like, well, hey, you're scamming the system. Well, guess what? Big publishers do that all the time. You know, I don't think Mark Dawson did anything wrong. He was supporting the industry, he was supporting the publishers. He was supporting his fans and, and he got uh, crapped on uh, for that. And so I, I think it was, it was kind of a weird, uh, weird one. And why not? He's supporting a bookstore. And again, like the quantities I'm buying are never like, I'm no, no Mark Dawson. So his quantities were big. Like, hey, if I'm buying 60 copies of a book, that, that ain't gonna be much of a blip on anyone's radar. <laughs> How do you deal with having your book catalog uh, catalog properly since most libraries no longer do their own cataloging? Yeah, so uh, the, the libraries often use MARC records, M-A-R-C records. Uh, I have a link to that over on uh, marklussie.ca slash authors bookstores libraries. Uh, there's, a, there's a link to more information about that because it's really complex. But a lot of them uh, do rely on uh, BISAC, Book Industry Standard um, Subject and Classifications, uh, the subject codes uh, that are tied in when the book is self-published. Because they, they usually get feeds uh, either through a distributor that goes into a place like Overdrive uh, that would deal with uh, libraries or Baker and Taylor that uh, wholesales to libraries or Ingram. And then usually they interpret the Book Industry Standard subject codes into MARC records for you. So that's a, that's a, that's usually one way uh, that that can happen. Uh, now I see a maker books returnable. And then uh, Gary said, are the returnable books stripped? So Gary, um, returnable books are only stripped in the case of mass market paperbacks, which usually means that the publisher printed 50 to 100,000 copies in that small pocket size. And the reason they strip it is because it's cheaper to destroy the paperback. You rip the cover off, there's the barcode and all the information from the publishers on the front cover. And you mail back 300 copies of the book in a thin envelope to get credit for it because the cost of mailing those back and forth is cost prohibitive. It's cheaper because that's how cheap they are to produce. It's actually cheaper to recycle uh, those. And that's a, that's a, a long-standing industry uh, term. So we can't make our books strippable when they're print on demand. <laughs> they're actually fully returnable. So what I did with my return, returnables for Ingram is I pay a little bit extra because they're hardcover. They're a little bit more durable hopefully not going to be as damaged as much. If they get returned, I pay extra to have them shipped to me. So I have extra stock that I can either maybe give away if they're slightly damaged uh, or, uh, or, or sell myself. And Michael, you have your hand up? I see. Yeah, uh, a quick question. Um, if you have your uh, book online for sale and you have your blurb, yeah. how critical is it to put that blurb 
on the back cover of the book as opposed to maybe just a blurb from another author? Um, when it's a self-published book exactly. that's print on demand, it's yeah. not what, I mean, by the time they have the book in their hand, they've already paid for it. They're not usually not going to see it, right? Like to pick it up and turn it over. So unless it's, unless it's going to be displayed somewhere or someone can see it, in my mind, it doesn't really matter. You just, you don't really need to have anything other than a barcode on the back of it, but um, it could be beneficial. Uh, it's, it's more beneficial in the description, like those reviews, those blurbs from a, from a big name author or someone who writes in the same genre and, and just raved about it or, or a, a review from Publishers Weekly or a review magazine or something like that. So, um, so if you wind up with your book, you're in a bookstore or in the library. I mean, if someone's looking at the cover. That's one thing. But how are they supposed to know what's inside of it? Because yeah. they, yeah. how, how are they supposed to know what's inside of it? Um, like what, what's it about? So you get that little blurb from another author. Yeah. Hopefully that's enough. Well, I mean, you, you should have some sort of description. It's, it's going to be in a category. The cover is going to speak to what the category is, yeah, obviously, yeah. the genre. And then then a little bit of a... Uh, and again, there's a whole art of, of, of that yes. sales copy. That's really sales copy. There's some great uh, Brian Meeks and Brian Cohen offer uh, free webinars and stuff on how to get this right. I've hired Brian Cohen, I read Brian Meeks book on the topic as well uh, to write blurbs because that is critical. Uh, thanks for the question though. I hope that did that answer it. So thank you. Uh, can I explain the one sheet? Marilyn asked, can I explain the one sheet a little better? So, so the one sheet, uh, I often use a PowerPoint to make them, uh, but you can just use a Word document, then you make it into a PDF. It's got the book cover, it's got the ISBNs, the formats it's available, when it's released, is it part of a series? What about you, the author? Is there, like Michael said, a, a blurb about the book from another author or from a reviewer? Um, it's basically a simple cheat sheet. And it very much looks like the sales sheets I would get from in catalogs from publishers. Hey, here are the books we're publishing this fall. And I would sit there with the rep and, and we would go through, it'd be a catalog of like maybe 50 books and they would highlight the five that they think I should buy. And that's what a sales sheet is. It's just yet another tool that they can look at and go in a single view. They're obviously going to judge it by the cover, but where can they find out more? So one of mine says, this is available through Overdrive, through Hoopla, through Biblioteca, through Box. So again, depending on what library system I send it to, if they use those platforms, they know, oh yeah, yeah, or we use Ingram. Oh, we use Overdrive for eBooks. We use whatever. So that makes it easier. Um, Jeff asks, uh, I hope Marilyn that answers sell sheets. If you have any specific questions, feel free to um, pop in and, and, and ask something or, or uh, comment. I've got five minutes left just to let you guys know. Jeff says, have you ever attempted to sell self-published books to a library wholesaler? Yeah, you know what, actually, uh, Jeff, uh, right here in Kitchener, Waterloo is Ontario's library wholesaler just around the corner. And I set up an account with them. And then there's a catalog thing you have to send. And, and, and I actually have fallen behind. But I am attempting to send them my full catalog of all the books. I've got a book I'm publishing from Sarah uh, Katie's uh, Graham. I'm re-releasing uh, one of her books and, and doing the, the next four in the series through Stark Publishing. Even though I'm not a real publisher, I am, uh, you know, I am working as a, hard as I can to get this book out there into the market. So I will want the library to know, hey, I can bring you some stock. Because the cool thing is I don't even have to pay for shipping. I can just drive them over. Uh, so I don't need to charge them shipping and all that stuff. So I am looking at that. Uh, and I will report back to the industry in general, because I think that's a possibility. I know it's a lot of extra work people aren't necessarily willing to do. For new writers, uh, perhaps uh, J. Paul Cooper says you should mention public landing rights. Thank you, my friend. I did not mention public landing rights. But if you're a Canadian author, uh, or you're in a Commonwealth country, if you're coming from another country, not the US, I'm sad to say, you can register for public landing rights. Go and put in your catalog, uh, February 1st, go just put a calendar entry that says public landing right. If you have a book that is published in print, in ebook or audiobook, whether it's traditionally published, whether you've self-published it, you register with the public landing rights and they will do a random sampling the following year to find it. And if they find it in libraries, you make money. The public landing right check that I received uh, in the last four years, has paid for the equivalent of a week-long, all-expense-paid tropical vacation. So it's not chump change. It's actually, it can add up over time. It's actually a significant, and, and the reason I know this is it usually comes in around the same time of year that 
my credit card has some sort of bill like that on it and it just covers it. So that's kind of a cool thing. Um, to, but definitely check out public lending rights. If you just Google public lending rights Canada, uh, I even got some videos online about that. Uh, the print on demand service that I use, um, I use a draft to digital print, which is in beta. So if you have a draft to digital account, you click on the little print tab and you can get added to the waiting list for uh, beta. But I, I use Ingram. Uh, now I used Lightning Source in the early days. That was the only way you could get in and you had to set up like a regular publisher account. It was a lot of bells and whistles. They now have Ingram Spark, which is like a easier front end version uh, to, to use. Uh, for print on demand. And whether you go through Ingram Spark or draft to digital, um, your books are available to uh, libraries and bookstores through Ingram, which is the world's largest English language wholesaler of print books. There are other services out there that may use and leverage uh, that, but those are the two primary ones uh, that I can use. I also use a local printer here in Kitchener Waterloo, uh, M&T Printing. So if I need 100 copies or 200 copies of something, it might cost me a little bit more per unit or sometimes a little bit less depending on the volume because usually with them, the, 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 the cost goes down with volume. But the shipping from the US, from the Nashville, Tennessee warehouse to me in Waterloo, Ontario is cost prohibitive. But the shipping for me to drive down the street and pick up a box from M&T is great. And even there's a, there's a company in Montreal called the Rapido uh, and they do print on demand printing and offset printing and they do amazing work. And I've used them a couple of times. And even the cost of shipping from Montreal to Waterloo is minimal compared to what I would pay when it's crossing the border. Uh, so I use a combination of print on demand services as well as local printers, especially if I'm looking for larger, uh, larger quantity uh, quantities of books. Uh, and uh, J. Paul Cooper says you only have to register a book once because uh, Steph Stephanie says you have to register for every year. So you register with them. You have an account under your author name, Stephanie. And then every year you register any new books that you may have published in the preceding year. Uh, and what does happen is your front list or your newer books earn more money when they're found in the library. And then after they are more than like five to 10 years old, you earn a little bit less every year. Um, and you can't register anything that's been published more than five years ago uh, when you, if you're first registering. So hopefully that helps you. Uh, so that is, uh, well, it's 250 Eastern. I hope I was able to answer all your questions. If not, ping me over at mark at marklesley.ca. If you're up for ghost stories, I'm doing a haunted fort tonight, a virtual haunted fort where we're just gonna be sharing ghost stories and having some drinks and being silly. But thank you guys so much for your great questions. I hope I got to everyone's questions and I hope you enjoy the rest of When Words Collide. Have a great afternoon. You too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. Uh, thanks for co-hosting, <laughs> Nicole. Appreciate no it. No problem. Thanks, Mark. Awesome as usual. <laughs> thanks, Sarah. So how meta is it if I want to reflect on what was just basically an hour long reflection of me talking. Um, I, uh, I, I was just thinking about um, what I'd said in the introduction when I, uh, to introduce the, the talk is that sometimes you need to, to, to hear something or see something or experience something multiple times before inspiration strikes. And, and that even happens uh, for me because sometimes when I'm putting together content of something that I may have spoken about before, uh, the effect of the audience or the effect of the audience I'm doing it for helps me refine it in a new way. You may have noticed, especially if you are an experienced indie author, you may have noticed that um, a lot of the perspective that I shared came to an audience that's probably not as familiar with indie publishing. Um, as as some you know specifically indie publishing audiences because when words collide is a very balanced conference and if anything probably leans more heavily towards the traditional published so when I'm doing a talk I always want to make sure that I, I try to cater the talk to the audience in question and and one of the biggest mistakes that I often make is I want to provide as much content and value and information as possible. And to some audiences, particularly, and I find this when I do this 
you know, for local libraries where people who don't even know the digital publishing opportunities that I really have to scale it back. I really have to pull my punches because I can really terrify people. Uh, occasionally I've done a, a talk where I'm just like, and here's all the cool things you can do. And, 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 you know, I look at the crowd and there's a big deer in the headlights look on their faces. Cause they're like, you can publish an ebook for free, right? Like, and I'm not mocking uh, those folks because this is something they've never seen. This is something they've never experienced. So that's something that's uh, really important to me. And it's really difficult in larger crowds because you're going to have a range of people. You're going to have experienced authors who, who've who done, you know, hundreds of different things or, uh, you know, been published uh, for decades, uh, traditionally published for decades. So they know the ins and outs of that. And so when I'm talking about that, they're like, well, yeah, yeah you're, you're kind of simplifying it a little bit. Uh, and then on the flip side, when I, when I talk about the indie publishing scene, uh, there may be th- folks who are, you know, from traditional publishing who go, well, well okay, that's new. That, I've never heard that before. That's interesting. I didn't know you could do that. Whereas, you know, somebody who who has uh, you know, a decade of experience in uh, in indie publishing is going to go, yeah, well, that's that that's basic. Why am I here? <laughs> I want to get something new. So that's always a challenge uh, that I have. But even if it is something that you've heard before, or seen before, sometimes for me, anyways, it is that additional access uh, or exposure to the content that that helps inspire me so like i said i hope you found something in that talk that maybe even is related to or maybe just a different way that i said it uh, than in in some of the previous episodes of this podcast where i talked uh, about this specific strategies for libraries or bookstores they were two separate episodes so i did go into a little bit more detail uh, for each but hopefully you found something to reflect on and be inspired with That's it for episode 207. Thank you so much for joining me here as a listener. I really do love the fact that I'm in your ear right now. Thank you for giving me the time uh, to lend me your ears. That sounds like I'm going to launch into Julius Caesar, doesn't it? But, But friends... Romans, I do love you, and I appreciate you being out there. So thanks so much for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes and links to cool things over at starkreflections.ca. Feel free to, of course, share your comments, thoughts, and reflections. Let me know if this kind of solo episode where I'm sharing audio from uh, talks that I've done, if you you find that valuable, you're like, well, it's just recycled content, man. I feel like you ripped me off. Um, yeah, let me know. I, I love to I love to hear your feedback because I do respect your thoughts and perspectives. So until next week, when we're gathered here again in this audio digital space that we are in and sharing, dear listener, here's wishing you great writing and good stark reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.